you know that taxes can be the biggest threat to your nest egg during your golden years? Here are five awesome strategies you use to save thousands of dollars on taxes. Hi, welcome back to the On The Money YouTube channel powered by Allied Wealth. I'm your host, Ryan Willis. Thanks so much for stopping by. If you like the content we're putting out, please give us a like on the video. Also hit the subscribe button as well. Type in your email address and feel free to uh, add comments in the comment section as well. So yeah, taxes. I mean, where do you think taxes will be in the future? Do you think they'll be higher or lower? Well, I ask this question all the time and people tell me, Ryan, I think taxes will be higher, folks. And this is from usdebtclock.org. Uh, and this shows that taxes, uh, the, the, the current national debt is $32 trillion in climbing. And, you know, we just had the debt ceiling raised and we're going to be talking about that again in the future and again in the future. And the reality is, is that if debt continues to increase, more people go on Medicare, Social Security becomes more stressed, and all these things are happening, by the way, that taxes have nowhere to go but up. Now, we look at this graph here, and what we see here is the historical tax rates going back through time. So this is going back to World War II. Uh, this is the stock market crash of 29. This is excuse me, World War I, then stock market crash of 29, then World War II, uh, the Korean War here, uh, Vietnam War, Gulf War, Afghanistan. What we can see is that you know the tax rates back in the 50s and 60s were, were really high compared to where they are today. And if you're to look at national debt back then compared to where we are today, they don't even, they don't even, they, there's not even the same ballpark, meaning we were not anywhere near 30, $32 trillion in debt back in the 50s and 60s, and we certainly are today in climbing, all right? Now, what's interesting about this is tax rates today are historically low, all right? So and we, another thing to look at is the average of the upper end tax, marginal tax rate, over this time period is 58.4. Today it sits at 37%. The average of the lower tax rate is 11.7. Today it's about 10%, all right? So what I wanna walk through in this video are some ideas and concepts to help you save money in, on taxes in retirement and keep more of your hard earned money in your pocket, all right? Now, these are today's ordinary income tax rates. Uh, and we can see that um, uh, for single filers, 10, 12, 22, 24, 32, 35, 37, same thing for married filers, all right? In addition to that, we've got uh, our deductions over here. So our standard deductions are 13,850 for single filers, uh, married filing jointly 277, and single filers over 65 get an additional ex uh, exemption or deduction of 1850, and married filers over 65 get an additional 1500 bucks each, all right? So what I wanna show you here is are there ways to keep you in this 12% tax bracket? And the answer is yes, you could have a substantial amount of income in retirement and stay in that 12% bracket, all right? So let's look at this. So what we'll look at here is we'll start for single filers, okay? I got a lady on the channel said, hey, Ryan, uh, do some more content on those that are not fortunate enough to have some significant others. And I'm speaking to you today, ma'am. So thank you so much for that feedback. We appreciate it. Um, so for single filers, the way you look at this is the upper income bracket of the 12% bracket for single filers is 44,725 right there, okay? So what we do is we add 44,725 to the standard deduction that we get and our over 65 exemption. This again, it assumes somebody over 65. And what that means folks is we can have $60,425 per year in annual income and stay in that 12% bracket. Hey, if you're under 65, it's okay. You can have 1850 a year less until you hit 65. Still a pretty solid income for somebody who's single, right? Now for married filers, uh, same, same thing, their upper bracket, is going to be 89,450. Uh, that's the upper bracket of the 12% uh, bracket for uh, married filers right there. Okay, there's 12%, 89,450, all right? Now, fast forward here again, and we go to 89,450 is the upper bracket. We know the standard deduction is now $27,700. And then we each get, for a married couple, an additional 1,500 bucks for being over age 65, added to that deduction, okay? So our total income we can have at age 65 is 120,150 per year. And in that instance, we're paying 12% taxes. 
Folks, on $120,000 a year, 12% taxes is not a bad number. As an advisor, that does not give me heartburn and doesn't cause me to worry about your tax situation. All right. Now, there's times when the, the, your taxes are much higher. There's other things that can impact this um, and being able to stay in this rate. One of them is when it takes Social Security, for instance. Another one would be RMDs later out in the future. If we start getting big RMDs, we may be mess this up. Okay. Now, folks, you hear us talk about on the channel a lot that we, we, we have this thing called composition of accounts, meaning I don't want all of your money you're using to finance your retirement to be in retirement accounts or in pensions and the re or 401ks for instance. So that's IRA, 401k, pension, 403b is another one. The reason why I don't want that is every dollar that comes out of those accounts is 100% taxable and everything I mentioned except for the pension is subject to a required mandatory distribution which is slowly being pushed out to age 75 but there's still going to be substantial amounts coming out of your IRA at 75 that you must take and those additional amounts may bump you above the 12% bracket in the future and you may not be able to qualify to get this income at 12%. So it's a great thing to think about having the composition of your accounts not be entirely made up of retirement account money. Let's have some brokerage account money. Let's have some money in some bank money. Let's also have some money in Roth IRAs as well so that we've got various buckets we can pull from throughout time and not impact our taxes. An example on that, by the way, is let's say that we, you know, we got to the end of the year and our income here, using a married couple as an example, was $120,000, 150 And we wanted to go on a cruise for Christmas, right? Well, if we're going to be over that by, by paying for that cruise, what if we had a Roth IRA we could pull that cruise expense money from? Or a brokerage account with no, with, you know, with no capital gains or taxes on it uh, to pull that money from? Or bank money to pull that money from? If we had those abilities to pull that money out tax without a tax consequence, we would save that 12% bracket. And then next year, we could figure out a way to replenish that bucket of money we took the cash from or just add it on to next year as well. So there's a lot of flexibility that we can do if we have different amounts of money in very uh, various buckets of tax categories and tax class. It's super helpful to uh, mitigate tax liabilities with that setup versus having everything in those tax infested retirement accounts. Let's talk about capital gains. This is one of my favorite things to talk about, by the way, is that a lot of folks that work for the big oil companies and a lot of them have stocks in those oil companies that pay handsome dividends. So if that's you, listen up. All right. So let's talk about this. For capital gains tax rates, uh, for zero uh, for, for single filers, you can go up to $41,000 a year uh, in income and then add deductions on top of that. Same thing for married filers, except you go to 83350 and add your standard deductions on top of that as well. So here's what it looks like, all right? So if we look at this, for a single filer, you've got 41675, 13850, and 1850, which means you can have $57,375 a year in income and pay zero taxes. If you're married, look at this, 83350, 277, the two standard deduction additions for being over 65, by the way, equals $114,050 a year, and you will pay zero tax on that income. Now, folks, that's pretty cool stuff, all right? Now, we talk a lot about composition of accounts on this channel and making sure we have proper tax structures, and there are ways to craft this type of strategy for your individual needs, uh, but it's super important to understand that this is a possibility but think about this. Let's say we started this at, say, 60, uh, and we weren't getting our, our over 65 exemption additions for, and for both married and uh, single filers. And they were, we, were, we were thinking to ourselves, we got to take Social Security, right? We got to get that Social Security income. Well, if at 62, you took Social Security income, you messed this entire thing up. Right. So if you want to achieve a 0% tax rate, you could absolutely do it and have substantial income, whether you're a single filer or a married filer, and do quite well with this. But understand, this is part of comprehensive financial and tax planning, which we do at Allied Wealth for our prospective clients and listeners of the channel. If that's you and you want to learn how we can do this for you, give us a call at the office or go to the Allied Wealth website and click the On the Money button. But these are certainly strategies that we are out there and they can save you hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxes over a long period of time. Now, one other thing to think about, this will probably stop if we go to age 75 and we're forced to start taking money out of our IRAs, all right? So keep in mind, there are ways to have a 0% tax rate and have over $100,000 a year of income in retirement. Pretty cool stuff, all right? The next thing, 
Uh, Roth IRA conversions, okay? We talk a lot about Roth IRA conversions on the channel, uh, and we do that because, you know, Roth IRA conversions are the best of the best, right? You, you get uh, uh, a tax-free growth, um, you get tax-free income, right? And so pretty cool stuff, right? So to that end, a lot of people ask you, Ryan, what's a good strategy to use to convert money to Roth IRAs? Well, we use what's called the bump the bracket strategy a lot of times for our clients. And what that what I mean by that is this. Let's say that we, you know, we, we were married 65 and we were um, uh, we, we could spend 120, 150 and stay in that 12% bracket. Well, let's say we didn't spend 120 this year. Let's say we spent a hundred thousand dollars. Okay. Well, what we could do is use the remaining twenty thousand dollars in that 12% bracket. And, and go ahead and do a Roth IRA conversion with that $20,000 of, of income we didn't use and still be the 12% tax rate. That's pretty exciting. We can do the same thing if you're single, right? Maybe you spent uh, $50,000 a year. Well, if you only spent 50,000 bucks, we can convert another $10,000 on top of that and keep you in that 12% tax bracket. And folks, if I can convert IRA money to Roth money at 12%, I will do that all day long because over the life expectancy of a 30 or 40 year retirement, that can add up to some big numbers and big savings in the future, especially considering we know where tax rates are going, all right? So next thing here, uh, what about what we call the stealth tax? And this is uh, what we call IRMA, all right? IRMA is the stealth tax, and it's income-related related modified uh, uh, adjusted amount, all right? And so what happens here is as your income goes up, I'm going to step out of frame here for a second, uh, you know, $97,000 or less uh, for single filers, $194 or less for joint filers, you pay $164.9 um, for a, a Part B, uh, you know, in your plan premium, right? Well, if you start going up higher in these numbers, okay, maybe you sold a home, maybe you had a sold a business, you had a big windfall, maybe you worked overseas last year, got a bunch of income, you come home and are tired, right? You won't be making that income in the future. A lot of things that can impact this, but the bottom line is this. If you were down here in these areas, you know, you could be paying uh, two times... 428.60 plus an additional 50.70 a month uh, in uh, in premium um, for a Part D uh, drug prescription, right? Or prescription drugs. That's 478 times two, folks. All right. Add this and this. 478 times two. 527.70 times two. 560 and 76 times two. You could be paying almost two thousand a thousand dollars a month more in Medicare. Uh, the, and, and, for, and for Part B and Part D premiums, then your neighbor next door is paying one sixty-five a month for, right? So be mindful of Irma. If you get hit with Irma, or you find yourself out in, in this in this regime, all right, in this tax regime, okay. What you can do is file an SS uh, forty-four form, uh, and that will uh, help you mitigate this Irma tax liability. And folks, this is a hidden tax. A lot of people get hit with this and they don't even know about it or they're at least not aware about it. And being aware of this and all other tax implications in retirement can really save you a substantial amount of money because think about this, you know, if you're paying this extra premium every single, you know, year over year over year, that gets pretty expensive and it adds up over a long period of time. So be aware of this and know it exists and know it can impact your bottom line in your golden years, all right? Uh, next thing, Know this one. This is know what happens to the surviving spouse. Okay, what I mean by this, um, you know, is is if you're a married filer and your husband or wife dies, you can file a joint tax return for one more year. After that, you have to switch over here to these uh, uh, single filer tax brackets. Okay, um, and a lot of times, yes, the Social Security income goes away of the of the dying spouse and the the larger of the two Social Security checks stay, right? So if a husband's getting $3,000 and the wife's getting $1,500 a month uh, and the husband dies, the $1,500 a month stops and the $3,000 a month keeps coming in. So the larger of the two Social Security checks remain, all right? With that said, though, what happens is they get put over here in this tax in the single file tax brackets and can wind up paying a lot more in taxes because I don't know anybody who wants their husband or wife to die and their income to also go down. Now, over time, they may adjust things and have that income go down, but initially, that's not something that they want to do, have to be dealing with after the death of a loved one or a spouse. All right. So keep in mind this happens when a spouse dies, you move, you have one year to file the joint tax return, but after after that, you got to start filing single file tax return, and a lot of times, at least you see the income uh, go down by the Social Security, the smaller Social Security check, and that's it. 
it keeps kind of going along, right? And the taxes go up, which I think is one of the most punitive things in the tax code, by the way, and should be changed. But hey, I don't make the rules. I just educate my clients, my prospective clients and listeners of my channel on what's out there today. All right. Next thing, uh, know what the SECURE Act did to inherited IRAs. This is a really big deal and a big, big argument for Roth IRA conversions, all right? So the way it used to be is when a, 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 a non, um, a, a child, this is a, a qualified, this isn't, is, isn't for spouses, by the way, all right? So let's not get confused with that. This would be if your child inherits your IRA or grandchild inherits your IRA, okay? So the way this works now is it used to be they could take a, a distribution over the life expectancy, all right? Just like an RMD, okay? Well, today, the way it works is they have to take all the money out over a 10-year period. And they can take it out, you know, uh, uh, they can do it over each 10 years. They can wait at the end of 10 years and then take it all out. Or they can wait, you know, do a irregular withdrawals, take, you know, some money this year, don't take any of the next, take some more next year, not any of the next. There's ways to stagger it, all right, but it's all got to be out at the end of the 10th year. Now, let's think about that for a second, because a lot of my clients worked hard, paid their house off, put their kids through school. Kids are doing well in life, right? Uh, and, you know, they've saved money and they've got large IRAs, and they're probably going to wind up leaving a lot of that money or some of that money anyway behind to their beneficiaries. And what's really interesting is my clients and prospective clients are super tax conscious while they're alive. Well, I believe you should be tax conscious from the grave as well, right? I want my money to go to my kids, not Uncle Sam, all right? So the thing about this that I want to show you is, is listen to this. This is where things can get tricky, right? Because let's say you've got a kid that you put through, you know, A&M or Tech or, or, or University of Alabama or Colorado, wherever you put them through school, okay? And they, they come out and they do really well, all right? And they're making some big bucks uh, between the two of them. Think about this. Let's dump a $200,000 or $300,000 IRA distribution that they have to take on top of $364,000 in income, and that puts them all the way up here in the 35 or 37% tax brackets. And what that means, folks, is now 37% of your IRA is now going to Uncle Sam and the government. And I know if you were alive and still seeing this happen, you wouldn't want that, all right? So what that does is it really kind of gets into the argument of, hey, maybe I should consider Roth IRA conversions not just for tax-free income and avoiding big RMDs later in life, but maybe I should consider it for the way my kids inherit money in the future because, yes, even though I'm going to leave money to my kids, I still want more of that going to their pocket and way less going to Uncle Sam's pocket, all right? So that begs the question of should I do Roth IRA conversions from, from a standpoint of estate planning as well. And the reason why we should consider that, folks, is Roth IRAs, when they're inherited, are not taxable at all and would not be added to your kids' ordinary income. And when I leave money to my kids, I want it to be a blessing, not a curse. And bumping my taxes up to 37% and potentially higher in the future could wind up being a curse, all right? So folks, I hope you get some value out of this video. I hope it can save you a lot of money, thousands of dollars in tax liability in your golden years. I'm the host of the On The Money YouTube channel, powered by Ally Wealth, Ryan Wheelis. If you like this video, please give us a like down below. Also, hit the subscribe button as well. We'll keep you updated when we put out more content. Also, feel free to comment. If you want to find out how we mitigate tax liability for our clients, feel free to hop over to the Ally Wealth uh, website and go to the On The Money uh, button and schedule a meeting with one of our awesome financial advisors. We'll see you soon.